Dzień dobry Państwu. Uh, good evening. My name is Michał Syska and I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Ferdinand Center for Social Thought and the Friedrich Ebert Foundation. Uh, at our meeting, our discussion meeting, Karl Marx and the future of 21st century capitalism, how will the automation and digitalization of labor impact our lives? Our meeting is uh, part of a long-term yearly tradition uh, in association with the Friedrich Ebert Foundation and the OMS LaSalle. The tradition is that during the birthday or of our patron, the creator of uh, German social democracy, Ferdinand LaSalle, uh, we meet in Wrocław uh, and meet with uh, guests uh, from progressive movements, uh, trade unions, political uh, organizations, and progressive think tanks regarding the future, regarding the future of Europe and uh, justice, equality, all the values that are important to us, solidarity as well, social solidarity. Today's meeting uh, is quite special, as it is not only related to LaSalle's birthday, but also to a very important anniversary. In a few weeks, we will celebrate uh, Karl Marx's 200th birthday, uh, a man whose impact and uh, influence on social philosophy uh, is hard to overexpress. And uh, because of this occasion, uh, there are many meetings all over Europe regarding uh, Karl Marx's heritage. And we have decided that uh, this important anniversary uh, is a good time to ponder the future, to deliberate regarding a future vision of the world and uh, Karl Marx's words regarding what's uh, happening now and what will probably happen in the near future. As you probably know, the relations between LaSalle and Karl Marx were quite complicated. There were very differences, many differences among them regarding strategic and political ideas. But they also had different personalities. When Frederick Engels uh, informed Marx about the premature death of Fernand LaSalle, Marx uh, accepted it with uh, grief. and commented that uh, this piece of information, despite of many of uh, LaSalle's uh, weak signs, is very sad, and that his death was uh, yet another uh, improper behavior, example of improper behavior by LaSalle, uh, because uh, Marx was often irritated by LaSalle's uh, behavior, and he considers his death to be an example of, of uh, misbehavior. Before I present today's uh, panelists who accepted our invitation, I would like to give the floor to a representative from the Friedrich Ebert Foundation, the foundation without which uh, today's meeting and the entire tradition of LaSalle debates would be impossible. I'd like to give the floor to uh, the director, the death of sin. Ladies and gentlemen, I would also like to welcome you warmly at our meeting. I will speak English. I would like to, well, my name is Knut Detlefs and I represent the Friedrich, I have the honor to represent the Friedrich Ebert Foundation here today in Wrocław, Breslau. And it is, I think, a very special day and a day that is uh, also maybe has some symbolic meaning for us as people for working for progress in Poland and Germany, for progressive <laughs> politics in Poland and Germany and in Europe. Uh, today, uh, we, as a, together with the Center Ferdinand Dazal and the Friedrich Ebert Foundation and with colleagues from Hungary and my friend Torben Albrecht to, uh, from the SPD, we visited the grave of Ferdinand Dazal to commemorate his birthday. He was born 193 years ago and is, is in a way of course also not only connected to this city but also very much he is the f connected to the social democratic movement I think not only in Germany but in Europe and uh, he was the founder of the social democratic movement at the time later party of Germany 
And uh, I would use the occasion that uh, in 2013 we celebrated the 150th anniversary of the Social Democratic Party of Germany, not only in Germany but also here in Wrocław. And we opened this exhibition. It started with Lazal uh, in the in the beautiful city hall, uh, where there is also um, a monument, a small monument commemorating Ferdinand von Lazal. And we still had the possibility to do that with Sigmund Baumann, which at the time caused great controversy uh, in Poland, not in Germany. And uh, it was, of course, very special because it started our series to use this occasion to really think and discuss seriously about the future of social democracy and to use the vision of Ferdinand Nazal that he had in his time to inspire us for our discussions today. So I hope that you will use this uh, for the discussion today. Why do I say that Ferdinand Lazal was a visionary and why do I believe he was a visionary? Because at his time he discussed the future of work, the future of labor, and he proposed ways different from Karl Marx uh, to overcome the injustices of the time, the injustices of capitalism, the social cleavages, and in his thinking the state would play a very important role to overcome the injustices and to create a society of free individuals who would live in a fair society with fair wages where they could represent their interest and live in, a, in the pursuit of their personal happiness. So the combination of freedom, solidarity and justice is what makes, I think, um, Ferdinand Lazar is special, and this, of course, these are the core values <coughs> of social democracy until today. But the diff it's, of course, easy to say these big words, but it's now, of course, the task of the modern social de democracy to redefine these values and what they mean in concrete politics. And the other thing is, of course, which is very important for Lazar was the self-organization of workers and laborers and one thing that I always like to stress, one thing that Ferdinand Nadal really stood for was the alliance of intellectuals and workers. And this is exactly what made the social democracy in Germany stronger than other social democratic movements because there was an alliance between those that worked with their hands and those that worked with their heads. And this should not be split. Also, when we think about the future of the European social democracy and the cleavages that we have maybe now in our movement with like modern, globalized, middle classes and the working classes, the working people that have different working conditions. And this is why it's very timely and I think it fits very well not only with Ferdinand Lazar, but, uh, with, uh, but also with Karl Marx, that we today discuss the future of labor, the future of work, and what this means for us politically. And uh, we as the Friedrich Ebert Foundation combine with this event different lines of work. One is, of course, that we have here, that we are present here in Poland and work very strongly uh, since basically the visit of Willy Brandt in 1970, um, in December, on the 7th December of 1970, when he visited Warsaw and basically established the possibility for modern relations between Poland and Germany. Also, the Friedrich Ebert Foundation started working on Polish-German relations here in Poland. And one thing that was important at the, in the 80s when we worked in Wrocław was uh, Keeping, helping to keep the memory of Lazal and also keeping the very place where he's buried, um, just keeping it, that it would not disappear completely. And so that is one important thing. But we also own and, and take care of the Karl Marx House in Trier, 
And for that reason, we have a big, a global uh, line of events commemorating the 200th birthday uh, of uh, Karl Marx. And the, the events are from Trier to Beijing, but also here today in Wrocław as our Polish event. So thank you very much for taking part in this event. And I'm looking forward to a very lively and important and maybe also controversial discussion on this very important topic. And I would like to thank our dear partner uh, and friend, Michal Siska, for uh, making it possible that we can be here today. And I look forward to many more important events. And I hope this all helps. Uh, next year, we have European elections, which in Poland are always, uh, let's say, maybe don't deserve the attention that they would need. Uh, but nevertheless, I hope, of course, that we all together will help to make the European social democratic movement stronger in the future and that this will also lead to a good outcome in the European elections next year. It still seems far away, but I think it's decisive for the future that we take as a European Union and as the <coughs> citizens of that Union. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, firstly, a technical uh, issue that I'd like to mention. Uh, there are some free seats in the front and near the window, so please uh, feel free to sit down. And according to uh, our invitation, uh, the meeting is translated into Polish and English, so you may pick up a headset if you wish to uh, use the interpretation. Now I would like to greet our guests, our panelists. First of all, Dominika Pizowska represents uh, the All Poland Alliance of uh, Trade Unions and is related to the Warsaw Bureau Office of uh, the Friedrich Amper Foundation. I'd like to thank her, uh, excuse me, I'd like to thank uh, Norbert Albrecht for accepting our invitation and uh, coming to Wrocław uh, a number of days ago. He was the State Secretary at the Federal Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs in Germany. And it was Torben Albrecht who was uh, at the head of uh, a report, the 4.0 Labor Report regarding challenges in Germany related to uh, automation and digitalization of labor. Uh, Torben was also connected to the DGB. A uh, very important trade union hub, and he is a member of the Social Democratic Party of Germany. So thank you, Torben, for uh, uh, finding the time to be here. Also, I'm very glad to welcome Zoltan Bagatza from Hungary, from the Sofrona uh, University, an economist. Uh, the weather is very hot right now in Hungary, and you have decided to visit us and share your reflections, your views. Thank you for that. And also, uh, editor Edwin Bendig. Uh, you probably know him from the Politica Weekly and other media. He is a publicist, uh, chief of the academic uh, branch. And the subject of digitalization and automation of labor is something that he is eager to introduce into the Polish public debate. And uh, Edwin, I'd like to begin our discussion uh, by addressing you. Uh, in your publications in Politica Weekly, but also in your uh, note, your sign note in, in Facebook that you created on your way to Wrocław, you wrote that uh, Karl Marx is a great perspective, great point of view to talk about uh, the digitalization automation of labor. I'd like you to elaborate and to justify that thesis as it is in the context of our knowledge regarding Karl Marx and the fact that there were no robots in Karl Marx's time and no Facebook and no internet. This thesis uh, at first glance is quite controversial. So if you could please explain why uh, did we do well deciding to combine Karl Marx with the automation of labor? 
uh, good good evening. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, um, and giving me the opportunity to, to uh, voice my opinions. First of all, Karl Marx is a character very essential to talk about the future of capitalism and capitalism itself. And uh, the context of digitalization automation is also very important. And he is a, quite a, a paradox. He did not deal with the future directly. Some would assume uh, his thesis regarding the fall, the future fall of capitalism. Uh, but Marx never wrote it himself. He did not have any uh, arguments uh, regarding the fall of capitalism. He would talk about capitalism as a Marxist. So to answer those, to, to address those who use his con uh, intellectual construct uh, for political ideas and uh, use Marxism to that end. So how come this character can somehow shed light on future problems? Uh, problems that are very fresh, intellectually tackled from a number of years, since a number of years, and as an economic, social economic problem for uh, over uh, 10 years. So the question regarding automation and the future of labor. There's one reason why he is uh, an important character here. He was one of the most renowned researchers of capitalism as a system of uh, producing value and the impact of the system on other uh, spheres of reality, on politics, on social life, and the connections between these areas. And that's many aspects of what he did uh, we are discovering right now. We are still digging through uh, some of his publications. Uh, only in this century they, they are discovered. So it turns out that his uh, thinking regarding the center and the peripheries of the world were quite different from what we know. He did not uh, undermine the a possibility of uh, the evolution of uh, capitalism. He was uh, quite fascinated with the uh, model of uh, the com communion model in uh, the Russian uh, countryside and also creating economic value in communities in, uh, for example, South America. That was also, it turns out, uh, a subject of his research. Also, ec ecology, ecological matters. There are those who uh, continue his work, just like Jason Moore, uh, who show how we can use Marx to refer to uh, analyzing the Grundrisse. Uh, one of his la last works, later works, excuse me, uh, not the later work, but uh, it was discovered quite late in the 20th century. In 1986, it was uh, published in Poland near the end of radical, along with the process of uh, the accumulation of knowledge, which uh, emerges in the technical system, uh, service and capitalism. Firstly, he shows that this is a process of continuous accumulation of knowledge, which leads to the creation of a very interesting category that he introduces, the general intellect, general intellect which is, and this is something that uh, is a task for us to interpret. First of all, the general intellect is uh, knowledge as part of the capital, production of capital. So a means of production to produce uh, knowledge. And this is a, a very popular misunderstanding in many interpretations. Marx, they, some say that Marx did not uh, get involved with knowledge regarding the production of capitals, that it was not important to him, but it turns out that it was very important to him that he show that uh, the importance of knowledge as a direct means of production will grow in within capitalism. So the fundament of uh, knowledge-based economy may be found in his work. But also the tensions that he shows are very important, uh, that knowledge is a type of capital, so it is subject to being disposed as, or to being used as uh, by capitalists and to be used within the processes described by Marx, uh, that is alienation, etc. On the other hand, knowledge is also, uh, has a certain re social relation to it. 
a relation which is not entirely uh, subject to the logics of uh, to the logic of, of capitalist accumulation. So there is a certain pressure within the technical system regarding knowledge, which is a sort of a threat, and this is a sort of dialectic uh, clash regarding capitalism. And it also is related to emancipation. There is a large emancipation potential within. What is essential in this approach, and in a moment I will move on to today's reinterpretation of this, is a systemic approach to technology. So. Talking, when talking about machine, uh, Marx does not think about a robot that will uh, replace a worker, but a whole system of organizing production that is mechanized. And it is uh, different from the era where uh, people only used uh, certain equipment, certain machines. Even in the medieval times when we had water mills, water wheels or, uh, as, as a source of energy. But the difference is that Back then, the machine was governed by humans and served this purpose. In the technical system, the relation is uh, reversed. Uh, the human becomes just a small part of the machine system. And this, is, this introduces the problem of alienation and the proletarization, uh, which is based on the fact that the, tr the knowledge which is transferred into the technical system and acc accumulates within the system uh, as a result of the uh, revolution, the uh, economic and the knowledge revolution, uh, means that the, uh, the human does not really know how to properly uh, work. This is uh, referred to as uh, de-skilling. So, uh, Okay, brainlessness might be a way to, to call this, but a, a, a human being is just a small part of a whole machine. Uh, in public, uh, popular culture, Chaplin's film, Barn Times, uh, shows this. This does not only refer to manual labor, but also to intellectual labor. This is his heritage a certain theoretical concept. Today we witness times when we can tackle this thing and, and prove whether he was right. So one of uh, his most important uh, people continuing his thought is Franco Berardi Pifo, an Italian researcher and the, uh, theorist regarding uh, digital capitalism. And he also refers to Marx quite often and the general intellect category. And he shows how today this system works by showing that the problem is not, the direct problem is whether a certain machine will replace a worker. That's the direct problem. But what is more, more, more important is whether uh, social institutions are becoming machines themselves. So uh, let's say a university, whether it will remain a university or turns uh, or as an um, institution um, that produces knowledge, or it turns into a machine that produces uh, representatives of the proletariat who need to serve as the machine. An example of this machine would be Facebook. This is a key question. Uh, whether it, it, the problem is not that Facebook will, uh, or, or a similar solution will replace our work, but whether it will influence us, turn us into something else. And we already have, uh, we already know the significance of this issue as we're talking about uh, producing not only knowledge uh, within the academic system, but uh, indicators, parameters, points. Uh, this clearly illustrates what Bifo uh, considers Marx to have foreseen, maybe not foreseen, but simply described as a certain logic. looking deeper in a systemic manner at this uh, macro structure transformation, which is a proper illustration of these processes, is a certain metaphor, uh, an attempt at describing or creating a description of, of, of a direct problem proposed by a different researcher 
uh, Barry Wellen, who speaks of uh, a social iOS operating system. Uh, this may be a contemporary interpretation of the general intellect as uh, influencing social relations. Within contemporary society, the, mo the, the most important, you might say, operating center, the brain, uh, used to be the state with its institution. Max Weber referred to them as an iron cage of rationality. That is a system of a rationalized way to make decisions so that as a contemporary modern society uh, related to institutions, we can uh, achieve our common goals. But when general, the general intellect showed up uh, as direct solutions, just like the, uh, the telephone, uh, the internet, uh, Google, Facebook, it turned out that these functions uh, are reclaimed from the institutions to AI implemented within IT systems, systems that do not require social institutions such as these created by the state to support and coordinate our actions as people, participants of contemporary society. And this leads to a situation uh, that this has different consequences. On one hand, uh, this hyper-rationalization of institutions w which try to catch up this AI logic. So, for example, uh, universities trying to catch up uh, to the importance of, of Facebook or Google. And on the other hand, these institutions are losing their uh, their authority. We uh, suddenly find that we do not require these institutions. We can coordinate our actions using systems of uh, exterior int intelligence or rationality, just like Facebook. At the same time, redirecting our competence regarding decision making onto those systems. So all sorts of uh, support systems, decision support system, which, for example, uh, began in Amazon as recommendations, uh, purchase recommendations. And this is developing, evolving. And the process of automation within this model leads to common proletarization, uh, depriving people of uh, social competences. This is the final, uh, what's at stake in this process, whether we will be able and to what degree reconstruct social institutions which can later uh, politically control subjects such as Facebook. This is a very direct question and we're looking for an answer. Mark Zuckerberg uh, yesterday said before the American Senate was a very uh, sad situation because it show how these worlds are incompatible and how political uh, control mechanisms in the contemporary uh, era uh, fall on deaf ears and are helpless. So we have to think of something to change this and this uh, and on this it will depend whether we will be able to introduce new innovations uh, to solve issues related to automation understood as environmental changes within the labor environment. It's politics that has to solve problems with institutions, political institutions. Thank you very much. Now, Zoltan Pakatsa, um, let me turn to you. Edwin Bendek uh, Bendek uh, showed a process. Uh, so talking about digitalization and automatization, I have an impression that there are two stories there. One is pessimistic. It says that automatization, robotization will increase the number of new proletarians uh, who will be deprived of good jobs or they will have no jobs at all. And automatization will be the next step of capital maximization of profit capital will be reducing the workforce in that spirit. And we have the alternative, highly optimistic story, which says that 
we are on the verge of post-capitalism and robots will bring us freedom. We'll work less for more money and have more leisure time. So as a person who analyzes politics and economics, uh, knowing the, the powers in the world, which is the most likely scenario given the powers in the world today? What do you think? Uh, the, the question really comes down to uh, who will draw an income in a world where automatization really happens. To me, the, the automatization thesis is no longer questionable. A couple of years ago, I'm, I was a little bit skeptical whether this, is, this was happening or not. But in recent years, we've seen a number of studies which actually show that this is happening. To me, it's no longer a question that it's happening gradually, gradually over time, but it is, it is happening. And so the question is, who will draw an income? And of course, owners of capital draw profit, workers draw uh, wages, and the state draws taxes. These are the three forms of income. So when you produce GDP, some of it goes to profit, some of it goes to wages, and some of it goes to taxes to the government. And so the question is, if this is happening, if machines and algorithms gradually take over jobs from human beings, who will have an income? And what does Marx have to say about it? I'm not a Marxian economist, but um, it's obvious what Marx says here. Marx says that um, we need to start from a, an assumption that there is perfect market competition. This is not something that people often understand that Marx actually was using perfect market competition. It doesn't sound like a Marxian thing, but he was because he was saying if there isn't perfect market com competition, then, uh, lead, then uh, capital will have an income from monopoly. So one form of income is monopoly. And this is something that um, a famous Polish economist, Michal Kalecki, wrote a lot about. So this is, I, I guess it's quite well known in Poland that one form of, of capital income is monopoly. And let's be honest about it, in today's world, um, markets are so concentrated that there is obviously a huge amount of income to capital from monopoly power, markups from monopoly power. So Kalecki is incredibly important in this res respect. So there will always be this income to, to capital because of increasing concentra concentration in, in, in industries. But Marx said, let's assume there isn't monopoly power. Let's assume that markets are perfectly competitive. Now here's something that not many people often think about. Uh, mainstream neoclassical economics has, has two propositions which are, which are mutually exclusive. One proposition is that there are perfect markets. So markets are perfectly competitive. The other proposition is that capitalism is driven by profit. Now the two things cannot happen at the same time. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but if a market is perfectly competitive, then there will always be price wars and there will always be a lower and a lower and lower price. And at the end of a price war, we bring down the price of a good to basically production costs. So, so if there is perfect competition, it eliminates profits. That's, so you cannot have perfect competition and profits at the same time, which is a quite important proposition. So Marx says, let's assume there is perfect competition, there are no profits from monopoly, that there is still one form of profit, and that comes from exploitation. So when there is still one form of profit which can arise there. There are various um, <coughs> theories of profit around which can all be uh, sort of dealt with one by one. I don't have the time to do that, obviously, but the mainstream neoclassical uh, theory of profit has to do with taking unknown risks. This is a guy called Frank Nye from the University of Chicago. This would be the, the economic mainstream. You get a profit because you, get a, you, you, you take on an unknown risk. Now, if this was the case, capitalism was a casino. So this is complete rubbish. Uh, if, if, if you got capital because you would be taking unknown risks, capitalism would be equal to a casino. You would put your money on black or white, uh, you don't know, you can't influence it, and you get to profit out of chance, out of luck. Look, if you've ever spoken to any entrepreneur, no entrepreneur will ever tell you that I have a profit independent of what I do. 
Yeah? I have a profit because I'm a good entrepreneur, not th through sheer chance. So this mainstream neoclassical Frank Knightian argument I think we can put aside. And there's the Austrian school argument which basically says that um, profit comes from, it's almost like product, profit in production is a lot like profit in trade, commerce. Basically profit in commerce is arbitrage. You get something for cheap somewhere and you sell it somewhere else for more. So you're basically using the price differential between different markets of the same homogeneous product and that's how you get commercial profit. Yeah? I buy something somewhere for cheap, sell it uh, uh, for more somewhere else. And basically the Austrians would say it's similar to that uh, in production as well. If you want to make, uh, I don't know, borscht, you have to buy cabbage, you have to buy beef, you have to buy, I don't know the recipe, but I'm making this up now, but you have to buy all these things and you, you sell borscht for a lot. And that's capitalist profit. Now, if this was the case, I would say to the Austrian school, people like von Mises or Israel Kirchner or people like that, they should go to a Polish restaurant, sit down and they would be served one big lump of cabbage, yeah, one raw meat, uh, uh, a glass of water, uh, some oil, and they should consume that. Yeah? Because if their view is correct, not putting together these ingredients, just putting them on the table would actually be a restaurant. Uh, so you cannot have that. Uh, obviously production is more than just buying ingredients and selling it uh, as a complete soup. Uh, uh, there is something involved in that. There is labor going into that. So I could go on and on and on. There are various theories, but basically none of them stand the test of logic. The only theory which does stand the test of logic is what Marx says about the labor contract. And the labor contract is unique in the sense that it's not comparable to uh, a, 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 any other contract basically in the economy. So when you're a supplier, and there is this famous economist, American economist Paul Samuelson, and a lot of you would have studied economics from the books of Paul Samuelson, he says it doesn't matter whether you are a supplier or an employee. I could buy your end product as a supplier or I could buy your end product as an employee. It doesn't matter which one of the two you are. But actually he's completely wrong. Because if, you, if I buy from a supplier, I buy a certain quantity. If I buy a certain quantity, it's fixed. I'm not buying his time, I'm buying the quantity of his end product, the volume of production. If I employ someone, I'm not buying, I'm never, I don't know if you've ever been employed with a volume contract. I'm certainly not employed with a volume contract. I'm employed on a time basis, and most people are employed on a time basis, which doesn't actually say how much you have to produce in, from 8 o'clock in the morning until 4 in the afternoon. It actually says we are buying your time, and once we've paid a certain amount of wage for your time, we want to exploit as much volume out of you as possible. If we don't exploit volume out of you, we make a loss on you as an employee. If we extract a lot of volume out of you, we make a profit on you as an employee. And that's basically, in a nutshell, Marx's theory of, of, uh, uh, of uh, exploitation. I think it's valid. Um, now, what happens if you replace people with technology? And this is basically the automatization thesis. And as I say, I believe it is happening. I believe that gradually you are replacing people's work with, um, with technology. The problem is that you, you will not have a profit. Because one, of, one part of your profit comes from exploiting people. I mean, I, I said at the beginning they will still have a profit from monopoly power. So capitalists will not have to do without a profit because there will still be a profit from monopoly power. But the profit from exploiting a person cannot be replaced by a profit from exploiting a machine. I just bought a new car last year. Yeah? If I buy a car, I know exactly what I'm paying and I know exactly how many years of service I'm getting out of the car. So when you buy a machine, you actually have a defined quantity of uh, service that you get out of that machine. It might have a bell-shaped distribution, 
You might be lucky, you might be able to use that car a little bit more, you might be able to use that car a little bit less, but, you know, overall, it's a bell-shaped distribution. After seven years, your car is dead. So you're paying a certain amount for a fixed amount of service. It's not like a human being where you can get more out of that human being than what you're paying. So effectively, you cannot exploit technology. You can only exploit human beings. So all in all, what happens if the automatization thesis happens? People will lose their jobs gradually. Last two weeks ago, I was in uh, Amsterdam, and at the main station of Amsterdam, I went into a supermarket where there were no human beings. Not a single one. I mean, there wasn't anyone packing the shelves. There was nobody supervising me. I took the stuff off the shelf. I paid at the counter. I didn't see a human employee at all. I think this is gradually happening. Uh, so people will lose their jobs. Capitalists will still have income. Question is, what will happen to those people who will lose their jobs? Now, the optimistic scenario is that we will give them meaningful stuff to do. Uh, but in order to be able to give them meaningful stuff to do, we need to have tax revenues. So the state needs to have tax revenues. Now, who can you tax? You can tax owners of capital. And here's where Bill Gates comes in. I'm sure you've heard his thesis. Bill Gates says, we need to tax robots. Now, this sounds nice, but Bill Gates should know, because Bill Gates basically introduced Windows to the world. He needs to know that technology replacing people doesn't take the form of robots. I mean, we shouldn't, we shouldn't imagine automation to be Android robots doing exactly what human beings are doing. Most automatization is actually hidden inside of some machine. It's part of your washing machine, it's part of your car, it's part of a, a, a machine that already had existed. So you cannot tax it because it's not like a human being. It doesn't have an entity. It's a couple of knots and bolts here in the machine. Even more so, automatization will be about algorithms. Algorithms don't even have a physical form. It's a program that runs on some machine. So Bill Gates should know, because he comes from that industry, you cannot tax automatization, because automatization will not have entities. The only people you can tax are the owners of capital. So I think to me it all comes down to whether, you, whether the state will be able to tax owners of capital, owners of this automatization. And if they can, then they can turn it into good uses. What jobs will be left for human beings? I believe that it will be what are called pink jobs. But this is a very gendered problem, unfortunately, because blue jobs are workers, white collar jobs are office workers, but pink jobs are called pink because it's usually what today are, are jobs done by women. And usually they're very underrated jobs, they are actually human to human jobs. Things that we don't want from a machine. Uh, child care, care for the elderly, psychological stuff, uh, even things like a yoga instructor, so anything which is human to human. Those are the jobs which will increasingly replace, in my view, jobs which can be routinized by machines. This, these are the jobs we don't want from machines. I don't want a machine to hug me if I'm an old person. Yeah? Part of taking care of an elderly person is lifting them out of their bed, taking them to the bathroom and washing them. That's something a robot can do. But part of taking care of an elderly is somebody to hug you, somebody to listen to you. This I don't want from a machine when I'm old. Yeah, I never believe that a machine can do this uh, the same way as a human. So we're basically looking at human-to-human -human jobs. These are, as I say, very, in a very gendered way, called pink jobs today because it's mostly done by women. But it will be done by men and women in the future if the positive scenario comes uh, to, 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 to life. But for that, you need to tax these people. So it all comes down, in my view, to the question of, okay, owners of capital will still have a profit. Can we tax them? Uh, the, the pessimistic scenario is, of course, that we cannot. So if you look at the trends, the neoliberal trends of the last 20, 30 years, with all the concentration of wealth in the hands of fewer and fewer people, you can draw up a pessimistic scenario which will not enable you to tax people, which will not enable you to, for instance, give people a... Uh, uh, an unconditional basic income. 
uh, or any sensible job. But uh, the reason why I think that's, that the pessimistic scenario <coughs> is not so realistic is because if capital keeps on producing stuff, there is a question of underconsumption. The question of underconsumption is who will buy that stuff? So if they keep on producing these things with the robots, with the algorithms, with the machine, the mechanization, if people do not have an income, nobody will be able to buy the products. So I think in order for the economy to function, you will have to figure out some form of a compromise between owners of capitals. You will have to give people a social income with which they can buy what is being produced. Otherwise, there's, a, there's underconsumption. Thank you very much. Now let me turn to Torben Albrecht. Hi. And uh, you, the only one here among us panelists uh, who represents or represented until recently the government, which first tried to diagnose uh, the problem and secondly to propose recommendations of what can be done. Zoltan has just said that taxation of capital is the essential thing here. And that is also a task for democratic institutions uh, such as the state. What is your experience as a member of government? The government which uh, decided to face uh, the challenge. So please, could you tell us more about that? Yes, thank you very much and thank you for inviting me here um, to Protsvav to discuss these issues with you because I think they are crucial really for the developments of our societies and especially for the developments um, of workers um, now and in the future. Um, we did a dialogue starting with a simple question, how do we want to work in the future? What is our idea of how work should look like? Because, and that is my starting point also, against what already has been said. I think when we put this in a framework of 200 years of Karl Marx, one of the most dangerous and earliest misconceptions of Karl Marx, already starting with Friedrich Engels, was that there is a determinism, a technological and uh, societal uh, and historical determinism. And I think we are again in, the, in danger to discuss this kind of issues in a deterministic ways. So I was happy that Zoltan Bogatza already talked about two possible scenarios. Um, and I think if you look deeper into things, um, even there are much more scenarios thinkable. I would not, after um, looking into these kind of things for several years now, um, subscribe to a scenario that automatization is really coming. There are a lot of factors that are influencing it. Um, there are choices in society that can be taken. That is, of course, a power struggle. It's not just a simple choice this way or the other, but there are different interest rests around. And, and, and there are developments which are not visible on the first uh, second, but come later. Um, a lot of the studies that are looking at the potentials of automatization are looking at tasks and certain jobs that can be automized. Especially the, the, the very famous Frey and Osborne study from, from Oxford, where then you have the result that 49% of the jobs, if you look at Germany, would be 42% of the jobs can be automatized in the coming years. But they just look at technical tasks that can be automatized. My most favorite example is that of a school bus driver. If Frey and Osborne look at a school bus driver, they would say probably if automatized driving is possible, 80% of the tasks of school bus drivers um, are no longer needed. But I'm not sure if I would be happy to put my nine-year-old daughter on a school bus with no adult on the bus, especially not if I think back on how we behaved on our school bus. So I think there are choices to be made there. And then if you look at automatized public transport systems, and some in Germany are already rather far developed, and you can see that there are a lot of jobs in the back office on the one hand side and the personal services that are um, being developed and are um, just occurring now. So we will see, and I think it's not 
yet decided whether we will really go into the situation where a lot of jobs will be lost, or like we've seen in the past that some jobs will be lost, some jobs will change and other jobs will newly appear. And um, this also has to do with the idea how we um, shape this kind uh, of development. And uh, Mr. Bending already talked about um, the machine as a system. And I think Karl Marx not only in the Grundriss but already in the Communist Manifesto talked about humans being just an attachment to a machine. Um, and he was talking about his time of early industrialization. If I look at a lot of jobs now, I, um, maybe even 20 years ago when there was not so much about digitalization around, I could see that some jobs were like this and others weren't. And if I look at the developments now, I can see also both sides of the coin. I can see on the one hand side um, the possibilities for um, much more freedom in um, the, the shape your work is taking. New possibilities, for example, for um, persons uh, with handicaps um, to participate in the working life due to technical uh, possibilities because you don't have to necessarily see if you want to um, um, cooperate uh, with a computer or um, if you put on an, an exoskeleton which helps to strengthen your, your physical force then you can do tasks you were not able to do uh, in the past you can have a lot of assistance systems that were not possible some years ago but on the other hand I also see um, e-commerce logistics centers where workers are punished just because they go the wrong way or they make a break for certain sec uh, some seconds and there you can see that people are really becoming the attachments um, of the machines so I think that, that is one of the major choices or let's better say struggles we will have about how we use this technology and I think we have to discuss this on all the levels from the single shop floor level in a company up to international levels and I will talk about that maybe later why we need it on, on all uh, these levels. So I think there are different possibilities there. When I say um, and, and I agree that a lot of this of course who will um, profit from the revenue and uh, Sotter Bogatza said you can't tax automatization, probably not directly, and I also would not uh, prefer to have a robot uh, tax. But we see that there's one thing that is, plays an increasingly huge role in the question of wealth distribution, especially in the most advanced forms of uh, internet platforms, etc., and that is data. And I think um, Commercial use of data is something that can be taxed. And it's not only about taxing it, it's also about do we really accept, and that um, has to do with the monopoly issue, do we really accept that I, when I use an internet platform, I do some work there which is not paid actually, um, and I, I give my personal data into the system. I do this also if I drive a self-driving car or a car which has a lot of technology and uh, etc. Shouldn't we discuss how we can protect for the individual the use of his or her own data on the one hand side and how, what do we do with the aggregated data that are aggregated from thousands and millions of people? I think this kind of aggregated data is something that should be a public good. Why should it stay in a certain company? Why should it be open to other companies, to public institutions? and to networks who want to use this kind of information that is around. That is, can the general interest be privatized or should it be privatized or should we make it a public good? Um, so I think, yes, um, there are a lot of issues we have to discuss. We have rather radical changes in front of us and this of course means that we have to have the political will as politicians and governments to really regulate things. There's sometimes the argument you can't do that, but I'm not sure if you really can't. For example, in Germany, the, the um, Uber is not active in, in the usual way like in other countries, simply because there's a law saying that when you're commercially transporting people, um, you, need a, you need a license and you need certain preconditions. 
I don't know if this is a good solution to just regulate things away, but you can also regulate it in a way to make sure that, for example, some person who with a bicycle takes food from a restaurant to your home um, is employed by the platform rather than being um, seen as a self-employed entrepreneur of its, his or herself. So I think regulation is possible. I would admit there are some fields where it becomes very difficult. If people are writing computer programs on an international internet platform and being paid by a company uh, that is somewhere where there's no physical service done, um, I think it cannot be done on a national or even on a European level to regulate this. But there has been, have been examples in history too, um, where some sectors were very much globalized. Karl Marx also writes about the, the, the global uh, economy, um, which is developing in this time. And he writes about the chips that are carrying the goods, and they are today still carrying the goods. <coughs> Chip has no home country. It has some flag which normally has nothing to do with the chip itself or the people working on it. And there, um, the countries, very much pushed by the trade unions, worked out in the context of the UN system, the International Labour Organization, the so-called Maritime Labour Convention. A law system that has to be implemented by every single country um, to regulate this very globalized sector. Why shouldn't this be possible for internet platforms who deal just with intangible goods and the selling of work in this context? There are some ideas of our way of thinking. We did a lot of very concrete issues as well, reskilling people for new tasks, um, helping people who have to move from one sector to the other. Maybe we can go into this at the, um, uh, in, in the discussion. But I'm arguing that there are political choices to be made, that there are, if forces of people who want to keep their workplaces, who want to have a job in the future, and who want public goods to be delivered in the future and to have their wage share in the future, they should now start thinking about um, these kind of issues and how to make sure this can also be upheld in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, I'd like to turn to uh, Dominika Pizovska with a question related to the issue of the political issue and the social issue. Torben uh, mentioned that it is political will that influences whether the uh, process of autom automation and digitalization will serve communities or rather simply revenue. And I think these are also challenges for trade unions, which are a certain force which has an impact on the political will. And as a representative of uh, trade unions, could you please answer uh, a question regarding the challenges introduced by automation for the organized labor uh, force? And what changes, strategic changes, are required within the trade union movement to successfully depend our laws or rights? in this context. Thank you very much. As a person who is a unioner and uh, cooperates with trade unions in Poland, I observe the trade union movement in Poland and I am uh, supporting them. And I notice the issue that labor is changing and it will change and we cannot claim to these forms of labor representation that we have at disposal at the moment. And I'm quite happy that when I was uh, preparing for uh, my speech here, uh, I found a document that is called the future of labor. So not even uh, futuristic labor, but labor in the future. And we as the trade union members will have uh, an impact and influence on labor. And in this document, the Trade Union Alliance writes that in the context of digitalization, we need solutions, legal solutions, which at one hand would protect workers from the negative consequence of digitalization that I'll mention in a moment, but at, at the same time, we'll control these processes and create a chance to protect and support worker interests. We know that labor is about to change. We know that digitalization and uh, automation may shorten work time. 
or disturb the equilibrium between uh, professional and non-professional lives. But I believe that each of us, sooner or later, will be confronted with automation in some of our tasks, some t tasks that we perform. And our chance, and our task, as social partners, is to provide direction to these actions so that the time that we earn will be used successfully and efficiently. Uh, referring to what Torben mentioned here, it is the will of politicians to regulate certain issues or not. I believe that that's true. We should try to regulate them, and I believe that the Union, European Union should play the major role of the world leader in this respect. What, so what should be done uh, from point of view of Poland? I believe that the state's social partners, institutions should study which sectors in Poland in the nearest future will be will suffer from uh, digitalization, will become subject to automation, to what degree, when will it happen, and they should, uh, first and foremost, invest invest in these sectors that will remain uh, untouched by digitalization to maintain this equilibrium and a large challenge in Poland would be crowd working, working within a platform. You have mentioned the digital proletariat. I believe Edwin mentioned that. I think that what awaits us and what I see among my colleagues is a digital uh, precarity, precariousness uh, of labor. We will be working in our bedrooms, in cafes, for diminishing funds, for diminishing incomes. Right now, crowd working depends on uh, having this mythical employer or customer who, uh, let's say, uh, provides us with a task, let's say, translation. Uh, dividing this task into micro uh, tasks, into smaller tasks, so that people working online are in competition when fulfilling these tasks. And most probably, the person with the lowest uh, price will emerge victorious. Uh, this might be referred to as a race to the bottom. I call this a digital precarity. I think it is an enormous change for trade unions to open up to these people, to find a way to address these people, mobilize them, or take care of their interests, whether regarding minimum wage or social security, which is essential or maternity leave, uh, sick leave, etc. Regulating work time. There are many ways to approach this issue. In Germany, from what I know, and in Austria, there are trade unions which have become involved in a platform, Fair Crowd Working, or G, o -R -G uh, which uh, studies these platforms and uh, assesses them, evaluates them. So let's say we have this I buy responsibly campaign, and we can check whether a certain producer uh, is fair in the way it uh, rewards their, their employee, employees, for example. So these trade unions created a platform that uh, studies platforms. I think this is a very interesting approach, and I know there are many of such uh, platforms within trade unions all over Europe. I also think that it will be indispensable to redefine the definition, redefine uh, workers and employers. Um, Uber was mentioned. Uh, whether such a platform as Uber or other platforms are an, an employee or an employer, excuse me. If not, whether it should be regulated. Whether people who work there should be protected by law and considered employees. In the current situation, uh, the law is somehow evaded by these customers. So trade unions definitely, perhaps now this is not a common practice right now, but they should influence uh, the strategies of companies. Certain companies work with exterior subjects, and this won't change. But trade unions should take care, should uh, make sure that the companies that it cooperates with are responsible companies, let's say, in a general approach. And also an essential thing, a very important thing, and this is also mentioned in the document, is reskilling workers, investing in education from early childhood. We all know that 
not all of us will be programmers. I will never be a programmer. But the state has certain or should have systemic solutions to allow people to acquire new skills. If there is a company, let's say a store in Amsterdam, will become completely automated and the workers will be fired, we have to uh, give the fired workers uh, ch a chance to for further work and to motivate them, educate them. So education throughout uh, the entire life cycle, that's essential. Also, uh, we mentioned that a person will be an addition to a machine dependent on the machine and will thoughtlessly do their work. I think we can avoid that. We can create healthy or balanced relations between uh, machines and people, complementary relations, when uh, the human will be in charge and, and the humans uh, will decide uh, about regarding their work and will have satisfaction regarding their work, will not feel passive and hopeless. Uh, in performing their tasks. So uh, this is called a human in command approach. And also the last point, taxes, taxation. This has already been mentioned before. So I think that this is a very important strategy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dominica. So before I ask our audience to join, uh, maybe uh, we'll have some comments. Uh, but let me ask about one thing, because in the context of Karl Marx and our discussion ownership uh, uh, should be mentioned. Uh, so you said that uh, trade unions should have a high impact on business management strategies. Different companies have different traditions in Poland. Um, employee participation or representation is very weak or actually non-existent in that respect. So. My question is whether the panaceum for automatization and digitization, digitalization challenges is not only the redistribution part, that is taxation, but perhaps there are also possible solutions in the way we think about ownership or the, our approach to ownership. And uh, I'm asking this question because this, um, the British Labour Party has announced uh, a program to promote alternative ownership, alternative to private ownership, including uh, cooperative, uh, co community ownerships, different cooperatives. And uh, in the reasons of, for jo Jimmy Corvin's uh, program, uh, challenges of automatization and dig uh, digitalization of work uh, are included. So employees in businesses managed in a democratic way, such businesses would be uh, easier to have uh, to distribute work in, in a fair way. So would you like to comment? Uh, on the ownership side, or maybe would you like to add any of you to that? Uh, just uh, brief, very brief, briefly. So uh, it's worth getting back to adequacy of Marx uh, because uh, it was the political answer, the political question to be answered. The political entity or in capitalism uh, were uh, political uh, n n power can be expected to come from, to remove capitalism or uh, put it to scrutiny. That is where the definition of social relationship came from, the link between capitalists and the employee, because we can hardly imagine capitalists and accumulation of capital without employees. That is where the strength of employees came from, organized employees. Uh, so we need to repeat that question today so where is the source of political entity here? So we can have different studies here, but who has the power to impose taxation on capital if capital is the dominant power now? And uh, uh, that is still a valid question waiting to be answered. There are different ideas, but now uh, it is moving toward production is moving towards knowledge 
uh, intellectual capital and knowledge through intellectual monopolies can be externalized and controlled by capital, but it's also a social relation, relation between us, people. What we're doing here, for example, we're not monitored here, not controlled. It's an act of free will, free minds, creating knowledge, thinking about solutions together. And so the previous speaker mentioned that. So we need to socialize general intellect as much as possible to find solutions to prevent us from fencing knowledge out and preventing access to knowledge. And uh, we can see that in the ecological, environmental discussion. So we talk, we have the discussion about climate change, mostly driven by public model studies, open studies, they are available in the public domain. It's a huge uh, asset uh, to mobilize activists, politicians to find solutions and knowledge about natural resources. We don't know much about that, how much oil is left there or maybe it's not much left. We don't know that. Corporations, multinationals have the knowledge. They manipulate that to create their corporate value. Maybe we'll run out of oil in 10 years, but we don't know because uh, um, surveying authorities of countries don't have access to that knowledge. And that is really crucial to predict the future. Uh, so uh, we need to make them social. social natural resources uh, can give us an opportunity to build alternative strategies, alternative to capitalism in such areas as GMOs. So one approach is to block the development of technology in the era of GMOs, and the other one is to make it public uh, for social purposes, purposes, an open source approach, approach to GMOs and to have new modified uh, rice based on publicly available knowledge uh, a strategy which blocks uh, the possibility of developing capitalism now and also the same applies to programming uh, mm -hmm. that um trade these kinds of uh, collectively owned entities would be a very very good idea uh, obviously, I think it would be a possible solution even to the question of automatization. Um, in reality, in most countries, these entities today are very small. They constitute a very small proportion of the economy overall. And in order to spread them, you would need support from the government. You would need, first of all, um, awareness awareness of the fact that they even exist, that, that this is a, an option. So the government should be pushing it as an option through education and media and just basically general support for them. But also it's a question of regulation. Um, and there I'm very pessimistic. Because if you actually look at the, the real existing structures of most industries, most industries are dominated by large transnational conglomerates. These transnational conglomerates are increasingly concentrated. So we have, if you think of what you buy in your own life, you will see that in a lot of markets, we're not talking even about you know, a couple of dozen companies. In, in most places, we're actually talking about three or four companies, so sometimes even less. Uh, and these large corporations have enormous power. They have market power. They have um, monopoly power. They have power over the government through campaign financing. So politicians are basically, in you know, most countries, in the pockets of these large transnational corporations. Um, they pay for the party financing. It really depends on which country we talk about. My German friends tell me that the German system in this sense is a little bit more transparent, but the American system, for instance, is incredibly dominated by large corporations. Um, and these large corporations do not have an interest in creating as an alternative socially owned enterprises. So as long as that power structure persists, uh, although I would much like to see socially owned enterprises as an alternative, collective ones, etc. Uh, but I'm pessimistic that this is a realistic um, turnout of events uh, simply due to the fact that we have allowed such over-concentration by large corporations. <coughs> I 
wouldn't uh, agree to what Zoltan Pogatza said that it is difficult, but I don't think it's impossible. But we have to have different um, aspects and projects to, to do at the same time. One is this break of the monopolies and in the field of uh, data-based uh, industries, it's the question of whether this data is publicly available, also for, for example, uh, cooperatives. Um, then you, I would agree that um, there has to be a state regulation interference that um, prefer cooperative-owned uh, companies against uh, privately-owned ones. I think that is the idea also of Ferdinand Lassalle, who was very much promoting cooperatives. For him, it was all, even the only solution. I don't think uh, he's right on that, but it's a possible solution. But he also uh, brought the state uh, into the game, saying, well, it has to be um, helped in organization and in a, in a preferred way to, to, uh, to be on, on the market. I think that's possible. And where that is not possible, we also have to think about how we can increase workers' power, even if they don't own the companies. And in Germany, we do have the model that on a supervisory board, 50% minus one vote um, of the votes is by the workers' side, even if they don't own the company. And the shareholders only get uh, this, this 50%. And we have works councils who do not only are consultated, but they have to agree on certain things. We now are introducing a right for works councils to take the initiatives for reskilling initiatives because we see that reskilling is a crucial issue. We have to um, deal with automatization and we have to give new powers to workers um, in our legislation. I think this is what, uh, necessary because ownership uh, will not come by itself as well as power does not come by itself. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please ask your questions. We have the first uh, three questions now. One comment and two questions. My first uh, comment is, I don't know if it is legitimate to use the term automatization. We're talking about equipment or devices which have, or machines, uh, which have the have memory and the power to, uh, the, the ability to learn as artificial intelligence. So, so uh, there was a failure on, um, uh, on Facebook and all boots uh, for customer servicing had to be switched off because they realized that those uh, computers or aut automated systems try communicating not in English, they were programmed in English, but they invented a language of their own to communicate. They had to be disconnected, those devices had to be disconnected, so maybe they have to be pro hard coded not to establish trade unions, I'm kidding, but uh, uh, talking about automatization, uh, I, well, at the back of my head, I have this uh, thought that it's not about automatization in the production sense, but all the entire uh, revolution in the change of our approach, a way of thinking. So we will have institutions which will be thinking, uh, or systems which will be thinking instead of us. They're not only taking jobs away from us, but they also take away the, the, the task of thinking from us. Uh, so they will be thinking instead of us. And uh, uh, Google's uh, CEO recently said that AI will change human lives more than electricity and fire. And I'm using the example of Google because Google was the leader in artificial intelligence. They had a team formed by a young Chinese researcher, 12 or 13 uh, people. And uh, now the Chinese uh, gentleman decided to leave the team because China uh, actually offered him to, to head a team of uh, 1,300 people. 
uh, on artificial intelligence. And uh, second question, what do you think about the 23 Asiloma uh, principles or rules? Uh, yeah, so do you think it is uh, possible to implement them in the uh, capitalistic system? Those principles which were developed, maybe they should be 25, not 23. So they were actually a form to prevent the threat of artificial intelligence. Can they be applied practically in the capitalist system? Or to put it straightforwardly, do you think an international organization which will take care of this will be more important than the United Nations now? Paweł Laskowski, Razem Party or Together Party. So the previous question was about terminology. So I will also ask about terminology, like uh, uh, like a student who is not very good and not very knowledgeable. Digitalization debate. What is digitalization? Could you please make it more precise? What you mean digital by saying digitalization? And my second comment is to Mr. Bendik. So I think I heard you saying, maybe you could put me right, that here, that there is a change where uh, the role of the entity which organizes the state uh, is taken away by artificial intelligence, away from the, this role is taken away from the state. But they are not autonomous beings, uh, artificial intelligence systems, they are owned by large multinationals. So, so it's capital, really, which controls artificial intelligence. And I'd like to thank the lady. I'm sorry, I have not noted down your name, but uh, uh, digital precariousness is our future. I'm an academic, an academic teacher. And uh, in a couple of years, I will not be needed because Khan Academy and others uh, online websites will uh, replace me. Uh, so uh, I'll just make this uh, as a point. Maybe you can refer to that, and that would be nice. So cooperatives, uh, to you've mentioned, it seems uh, to um, match uh, uh, this uh, the representation of crowd work, the economy of sharing, sharing economy. Everyone g contributes something. It sounds like cooperatives. Uh, but so the question is how what how can we um, uh, bring um, the crowd working and the sharing economy closer to this rosy image because it's far away from it so her name is Dominika Pizowska uh, I came from Apollo and I'm really glad to be part of this discussion about Marx, because I thought I would never be able to, to participate in a discussion about Marx, so what we can take away, so takeaways from Mar uh, Marx. So it's been very interesting So uh, to, to organize some things here. So in the first writings of Marx, it is stated that workers, maybe today we can say employees, um, uh, is uh, exploited always. There is not a single situation where uh, employees are not exploited. And social democracy has this idea of guaranteed income. And it, in Marx's view, it will also be a form of exploitation. Maybe uh, it, there is a solution here, but I think uh, it is uh, more uh, uh, closer to Pope's, uh, so like arms, and closer to Pope's teaching or Catholic teaching than socialist teaching. Uh, and my second impression is uh, uh, that uh, governments are not able to cope with multinationals nowadays, and also the pluralization plur plur uh, where ma social masses are moved to the on the to the margins. So a colleague uh, has said that he's afraid of being replaced by a computer program. He studied for many years. He has the knowledge. Hammerhand in the roots of totalitarianism, totalitarianism 
says uh, that because of that situation, capitalism unites with those people who are on the margins. We have all those marches, 11th of November in Poland, so it's just a pretaste of what can happen. It's just a symptom of the future developments. And uh, th thirdly, I have it on paper. So there was a question of what future work should look like, but the question should rather be who should the future work benefit? Whom should the future work benefit? So, well, I, I am also part of trade unions, ZMP, so similar to yours, and uh, I think that in Poland we know who our employer and employee is, and also I think it's similar in Germany and in Hungary, but we have a serious problem mentioned by the previous speaker. 49% of work automatization in Germany, 60% of automatization in Poland, allegedly. So the Dawn of Robots book in 2015 actually shook America. It was stated that the easiest and the more repeatable the work is, the sooner it will be replaced. Uh, so it is a serious problem. So uh, I come from a town where people from villages work, uh, people from that town work uh, in Germany. And uh, you know, it's really hard to think about what is going to happen when they are replaced by robots. They will have no work at all. So digitization, uh, digitalization gives us hope. So we've mentioned cooperatives. Uh, I like this idea. So I liked it very much uh, when I was young. I supported it strongly, but maybe it's too late. Well, we are too late because the process is that all that thinking has light speed. It is so fast as the impulse in those machines. So they serve multinationals and well, actually where we can be eaten up by capital before we form our cooperatives. We will not even notice when they bought us. Uh, and we could uh, reduce taxes. It could work better if those cooperatives uh, uh, could uh, enjoy some tax reliefs or benefits. But hmm, the problem here is that uh, I'm not convinced that we can pay taxes because robots uh, learn they will be paying taxes. As for works councils, uh, Volkswagen and Skoda had works councils and uh, there was uh, an affair a couple of years ago in Germany because they were corrupted. Uh, and it's also a serious thing Mr. Edwin said. A uh, oh, oh, gentleman from from Hungary said the question is who will consume? Marx uh, represents the enlightenment. Now, so it's not about uh, consumption; it's about power. Who will be in power? Who will have power? So, uh, so it was actually pointed out in uh, just say that it was about power. Who will? control the masses. So it actually boils down to power. So if it's sold to only one million consumers, it doesn't mean that they will have less power, because it's never stated, and Marx never said, that everyone has to buy and everyone has to consume. So, well, as part of gender balance, I'll take the floor. I came from as far as Gdańsk to join your debate. And I agree, I agree with many things which have been stated and with what, what Dominica said and uh, gentlemen. So let me refer to the aspect of political decision making. Political uh, decisions are threatened or because politicians are afraid to face capital and uh, they are even more threatened in the EU as long as we have divisions into different speeds in the EU, because Dominica has rightly pointed out that uh, the EU should uh, handle the problem, should cope with that, the EU as a whole, but we still have uh, the division, the split between new and old member states, and unfortunately, 
the state is often very weak in those new member states. Politicians are weak. Uh, they don't. Uh, they are afraid to take political responsibility to take the side of citizens against capital. Uh, capital. So if the wants to tackle it. Uh, if it does not want to tackle it globally, we'll have further divides. Well, in weaker states, politicians often give way uh, to free capital. So why do we have the situation that Uber works so well in Poland and doesn't work in Germany? Because German politicians are stronger and they decided not to have it. And in Poland, politicians say, OK, let them drive, earn money. We'll have hot water in the taps. And uh, I think that uh, the, I, those uh, 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 divides can be bridged. I'm really in favor of uh, deep integration. And uh, not a single member state should be favorized. Uh, um, or should be favored uh, above others. But if, in that respect, if there is a leader here uh, in this group which tries to cope with the problems, I think it will be Germany as one of the most industrialized countries, one of the most automatized countries in terms of production in the EU, and a country which is thinking prospectively. Uh, it has a forward-looking approach, and the government has started to tackle this uh, issue. So I think that the, the, I would say Germany should be a leader here, but it may be really difficult uh, and divisive for the EU. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, so let me contradict the main point in the title uh, of our meeting, of our conference. Uh, and at the same time, let me thank you for, for inviting me. But Marx, Engels, Marxism, Marxism, Leninism, and many other forms of uh, modern socialist thinking were a huge change in history, uh, like a revolution of thinking. And uh, the problem is that 21st century and capitalism are not the last word of history. It's been proven by history so far. Socialist revolutions, uh, socialist states, uh, and uh, a political system which uh, proved to be a positive alternative to capitalism for various reasons, the system collapsed, primarily in the EU, in, in, the, in the Soviet Union, but uh, what was at the foundations of, those, of that system is still valid, because capitalism does not eliminate those military and social and economic divides that the world is facing, and capitalism can't cope with those. Uh, um, problems. Uh, for example, uh, this great bubble of uh, uh, capitalism economy, which is empty. Capitalism is trying to defend itself, including nuclear power, which is uh, the greatest threat. Uh, so I think we should have a discussion also about the great uh, theoretical achievements which are related to the prospects of development, not thinking about the end of history, as Fukuyama said, because the history goes on. But the world is so divided, capitalism is so diverse. Concentration of capital on the one hand, automatization on the other hand, actually uh, results in a situation where there are huge uh, opportunities for a socialist time um, revolution to put a fairer system in place which can help the entire mankind and not only selected uh, countries out, take them out of this marasm and problems of capitalism. Uh, so that's my question to the organizers and you. And I have this 
a gift in German to our foreign guests about the revolution. Thank you. Would anyone else like to take the floor? Please try to be brief. I'd like to point out that there was an attempt at uh, castrating Marx, uh, if I may say so, uh, turning him into a reformist. So the moderator uh, tried to suggest uh, to move the discussion towards uh, ownership, the problem of production uh, uh, ownership is still essential, even now in this age of uh, digitization. But this is not only about redistribution, but also at the level of production, means of production. Even if we decide uh, we have uh, basic income, uh, the alms that you mentioned will be uh, given out by the state uh, to have more control, since we do uh, and envision that we will be the ones in charge, and that perhaps uh, Mr. Orban will have more profits to distribute, and because of that, he will have more opportunity at social control. So this uh, kind of government is as dangerous as corporations, other corporations to me, maybe with a different flair. But the issue is how to create, and you have started talking about this, I represent a different branch of uh, the left wing, but I do believe that it is important to work out an alternative. Uh, having no alternative is what uh, eliminates any opportunity for growth and development for s solutions. The capital needs to feel threatened. Uh, the USSR uh, fell apart by its own account, yeah, in a way. Uh, but the threat towards labor, let's uh, point out how much energy is still put into pacifying worker movements, especially in Poland. Uh, this is a very significant problem, and this involves violence as well. Violence what I could witness uh, personally as an activist, trade union activist. So, out of this environment, well, from within this environment, there emerge certain solutions for these problems, suggestions for solutions, and uh, the attention is still directed towards means of production and what will be produced by these means. Not only distribution but, or allocation uh, of resources, but who will decide uh, these things. Uh, because uh, just redistribution will lead to accumulation, marketization within capitalism. So should there be social control? Not by bureaucrats, state bureaucrats, but generally uh, greater social participation. I wish that uh, we would consider ourselves still as workers as long as capitalism exists. This will be brief, uh, referring to one of uh, well-known theses uh, of, by Marx that philosophers interpreted the world and we have to change it, alter it. I have a question to Dr. Bagazza, who mentioned that uh, the most probable scenario is to maintain the current state of affairs. So for alternative forms of properties, uh, just like cooperatives and worker participation in ownership that because of the current uh, force, the struggle of forces, uh, there are no real opportunities for that. If we have a realistic scenario for change, what would the scenario be? Which are the strong points of the current system that we can uh, address and somehow change things for the better? Janusz Biernat. Thank you for allowing me to participate in this debate, this intellectual feast. A number of years have passed in Poland, and I have never had the opportunity to uh, take part in such a discussion. So briefly, to me, Marxism is a method. It's a metho methodology 
a way to analyze processes and social history. And the essential thing is labor. The division of labor and the labor synthesis. One revolutionary method for analyzing history and social processes is continued in reality uh, with the use of different terminology. Uh, organization management, the entire science of management, uh, is just proof of Marx, proves Marx thesis. Uh, but nobody talks about this. The most popular area of knowledge management right now fits this discipline of practice change, shifting from uh, sh shifting to digital technology. Uh, so this is directly proof of the direction that Marxism is taking, how reality is documenting changes which have been begun by the method, the methodology of analyzing social reality. I do believe that technology leads only to one thing, uh, to civic uh, identity, you might say, property ownership, power and knowledge is this uh, triforce that is in charge right now. I'll be glad that we had uh, more meetings like this because I think it's, it's crucial. Thank you. Thank you for a great discussion and for introducing the subject to me. I do agree that we are somehow mixing terms when we talk about automation, digitalization, and robotization. Uh, we're, being we're using them as synonyms. And the problem with this discussion is that the differences within branches such as uh, were in the past are growing. There are growing cleavages. And I think that it will be hard to uh, use one term for autom automation. I've noticed one issue that is worrisome, f uh, that is worrying for me, uh, and this was expressed by Mr. Albrecht, that the de-skilling process, the qualification process, is followed by a threat, the danger towards the world of labor when it comes to the opportunities for capital, uh, when it comes to control, forms of control. I believe that this issue in states like Poland or in the uh, peripheries of capitalism is far more significant than, or, or as much significant as a discussion regarding guaranteed income or technological unemployment, since automation provides great opportunity regarding controlling workers, uh, surveillance, depriving them of, of elementary rights. I think it is hard to say, hard to find a bigger threat to our labor and to labor rights than these new forms of control which result in a situation where the employer, or the employee, the worker, within these organization forms is deprived of influence on the labor process. By principle, programs which measure labor, measure work, uh, in a way, for example, in Amazon, or in the logistics department, uh, there's a situation where the employer using this type of software knows which of his employees disturb the labor process. And this gives great opportunities for repression, or great, yes, for repression, employee repression. Now, this will be our last comment, please. I'm also an economist. I have something positive to say. I don't understand all of these revolutionary uh, revolutionary comments. I think that a lot of them sounds like uh, the people who used to, uh, like the Luddites in the past, destroying equipment in the past. I think that digitization is uh, an opportunity for many workers. This is just like automation, a good opportunity. And why would this technological revolution would be different from the industrial revolution? Could you please answer that? And also, why do Western states incapable to create innovation for, as we know, one of the, or perhaps the only 
great startup which worked in Germany was Spotify. And I think that's it. With other countries uh, doing better, countries where we have an alternative model directed towards the free market. So Asian tigers uh, or the US. Uh, we have innovation there. So where does it come from? And also last question regarding to crowdsourcing, uh, because these are the regulations of the market, uh, that price is the most important element. But I also hope that crowdsourcing will have an impact, because that's what happens in the market. Thank you very much. Thank you for all your comments and questions. And now, perhaps we have a reverse order. We'll start with you, Dominika. So briefly, why will this revolution be different than the Industrial Revolution? Because machine is not only replacing uh, physical labor, but also cognitive, intellectual abilities. So this will not only uh, influence the blue collar workers, but also white collar workers. And this is the difference, uh, I believe. I've noted two things. I really liked your question about how to make crowd working more rosy, okay, more appealing. It's very important. The first answer that I have, and I am also an academic lecturer, through education, but I think that's ins insufficient. That's not enough. I'm trying to explain my students that you cannot be competitive by price, that you have to maintain solidarity, but five years later I found them in the free market working alone uh, in a translation booth, let's say, uh, for very low wages. Uh, so it doesn't really work that well, but we shouldn't stop with education. Also, minimum wage would be a great solution, also in crowd working, properly regulated, transnationally perhaps, and introducing all social securities for employees. That's uh, the fundament, uh, the basic stuff. And also, uh, the gentleman from Opola, we know who are the employers and the employees. But there aren't sufficient contemporary methods of regulation of regu regulating these uh, work relations, if they are work relations at all, because quite often they're not even work relations. Let's imagine a person who is driving Uber cars, and it's not only, uh, not as an additional works, but makes a living out of Uber uh, and if this person uh, has some sort of uh, negative circumstances, like gets sick, uh, he's left alone. There is no work relation that is protecting him. So we know who is who, we can identify the players, but there is no legal regulations which uh, secure them. And that's it. How is this different than the previous industrial revolutions? And that was my starting point also a couple of years ago. I used to think exactly the same thing. Uh, when Marx talked about the loss of jobs, um, a certain ratio of people were working. If you look at the world today, a similar ratio of people are working. And since then, we've had revolutions in so many different forms, I can't even begin, you know, electricity, nuclear power, plastics, internet, you all know this, 20, 30 waves of industrial revolutions. Uh, so maybe industrial waves don't really lower employment, because if Marx's thesis was correct, then there would be nobody left working today. That was my assumption as well a um, couple of years ago. But then I took part in a couple of debates like this, and I realized that um, the reason why we have such high employment today is that actually technological waves did squeeze out people from their jobs. It's not like one wave comes and creates, obviously it creates some jobs. So when you have the internet, uh, you no longer need people who fix typewriters, but you need uh, people who know how to fix the, your computer, obviously. And, uh, uh, but if you look at the, the jobs which um, the private sector uh, creates, uh, has created since then, we would have lost a lot of jobs. The reason why we still have the same level of employment is because we have expanded the welfare state. In the 20th century, we have had a massive expansion of the welfare state. I mean, if you look at the times of Marx, and you take away all the jobs from today who are doctors, 
um, nurses, teachers, uh, trainers, uh, people who provide public transport, etc., etc. All those jobs which are associated with redistribution and the welfare state, you would actually have lost a gigantic number of jobs and there would be mass unemployment. So the reason why we have so many jobs is because in the 20th century we had redistribution, we had the welfare state. Now, which to me suggests, and this is a question related to the gentleman at the back, um, is redistribution enough or do we have to um, also talk about ownership? Um, Yes, I can see your scenario. I can see a scenario where a very small number of people own uh, the world. Uh, the Facebooks and the Googles and the other monopolies um, and the majority don't have jobs and the state, if it, even if it taxes basically in collusion with these large companies, would have total control. I can see that sort of scenario. Therefore, I think that, the, that therefore consumption is an important thing. That how many people consume is an important thing. I cannot imagine, to the gentleman at the back, I cannot imagine 10% of society consuming all that is produced and 90% not consuming anything for a number of reasons. I mean, firstly, because what do those people do? I mean, I can see at the beginning of, uh, beginnings of this, I can see why you are looking at this, because in our societies, as they are today, we have these people. We are, especially in Central and Eastern European countries, we are squeezing out more and more people to, the, to a kind of rubbish dump. Yeah? Let's be honest about it. A lot of people are on, even though now we have labor shortage in, in the Visegrad countries, but at the same time, those, there are some people who are not skilled we cannot contribute anything. We have, we have basically decreased our, so our welfare states. So we have a couple of million people who are basically on the rubbish dump of history. Now, if this continues, we can put more and more people on the rubbish dumps of history, which is a very negative scenario, obviously. Uh, but after a time, there comes this question, what do, what do these people do? Will there be outrage from these people? Will there be criminality, violence? Also. Who will buy the products because of this thing called the savings function? That if you are really rich, there was this, there's this famous TED talk by a famous uh, American oligarch, or basically a large entrepreneur. He says, "I'm very, very rich. I can consume a lot. I can buy I can I can buy a trouser every single day, but there are only 560 56 days in a, in a year." So I cannot buy more chances than that. Yeah? So there is an upper limit to what I can consume, even if I consume really heavily. And if you look at the actual concentration of wealth in the world today, most of this wealth is by the, by the concentrated rich isn't being consumed. And if you're not consuming it, if you're saving it, then it's not capital. It doesn't circulate in the economy. It doesn't constitute demand. Once you've bought an incredibly expensive painting and put it on the wall, you've taken it out of the economy. If you put your money in a yacht, if you put your money in an offshore tax haven in, the, in, in, in Panama, these, this money does not circulate in the economy, there's no demand, it doesn't fulfill the kind of functions that... So I cannot imagine a society where only a very concentrated elite of people consume and the rest don't. This, to me, suggests that there has to be a way found uh, towards broadening consumption. The welfare state was such a way, with redistribution, with the minimum wage policy, etc., etc. This was a way of broadening consumption. Thomas Piketty shows that with the decrease of the welfare state, uh, the wage share falls with the elimination of minimum wages or introducing very, very small minimum wages like in Germany, um, instead of collective bargaining, you have, um, you have the elimination of demand also. Uh, the state doesn't spend anymore because instead of Keynesian, we, we don't do much Keynesian counter-cyclical spending anymore and we are curtailed by the Eurozone, for instance, in what the state can spend. So the state doesn't spend, the white, white society doesn't spend, 
I think there is a, there is a problem of, of the lack of demand in the economy. You cannot maintain such a system. Now, obviously, I would like to see production collectivized, collectivized not in the Soviet way, but socialized as much as possible. I'd like to see investment decisions socialized as much as possible. Um, but that, to me, is a very sort of, it's, it's second step. And I don't even see the first step, because I don't even see the forces for, uh, for redistribution. Redistribution being the first step. If you look at the Scandinavian Social Democrats, first they had a redistributive state. They strengthened the middle classes. And in the 1970s, they wanted to introduce, and they actually did introduce a workers' wage fund. Uh, which workers fund, which basically was about transferring property from uh, owners to, to, to labor, uh, which failed for a number of reasons that's complicated to go into. But effectively, I don't even see enough social pressure even for redistribution. I don't think people understand properly the importance of redistributive policies for, for, for justice, for equality, but also for the effective functioning of the economy in terms of creating demand. So I think the awareness is in some senses missing of these, of these economic issues. Okay. All right. Uh, the, one of your comments was basically uh, enough to start a new debate. So I'll begin with the uh, very direct question regarding the system, the alternate system to the uh, iron cage of rationality which was concentrated within state institutions, uh, which shifts to, towards something that we can call an iron network of hyper-rationalism, which is basically physical capital. This was concealed in what I've s said. I, I refer to it as Facebook, Google, etc. So uh, thank you for mentioning this because I would like to uh, elaborate on this. This is about a system of external rationalization which is aimed at coordinating our mutual activities. Uh, so capital and not public institutions. And this is an essential problem. Also regarding the identity, the foundation f of politics. Uh, I'm glad that uh, there was a very liberal uh, comment in, uh, among our uh, audience. There are certain schemes, structures within this comment. If we look at innovation, and at statistics and comparisons within innovations, it is not true, it's also not a lie, but that liberal economy support innovations. But if we look at the first 10 countries, Denmark, Sweden, Holland, uh, these are not countries that are ultra-liberal. We would say they have a strong social model and it is there that this innovation takes place. And the other sector within states, especially in the startup sector, is the war, con uh, war countries, Israel, where, or the US, where part of the high tech is part of us, the military spin off, where the expenditure towards uh, the development of uh, military technology is more than 5% of GDP. So it is good to be aware of this. What is the difference between this revolution? Danny Roderick, in his concept of premature deinstrumentalization, mentioned this properly. The problem is that modernity within institutions, redistribution of the welfare state that we know is a modernity based on industrial economy. And all the states which uh, wanted to uh, realize this welfare model uh, repeated the industrial model. The problem is, and Danny Roderick mentioned this, that the later you enter this model, the quicker, the faster you achieve maximum uh, overuse of, of economy and China stopped at 20% because of oversaturation, oversaturation in generating GDP. India, it's even lower, 15%. And this is essential because all the institutions, uh, for example, the political, political institutions and trade unions are organized around an organized world of labor within industry. So it's not that the industrial, the worker class was uh, the most numerous. Uh, House services was uh, the majority, but it was not a class in itself. It was a precariat at that time. It had common problems of uh, exploitation, just like today. But today, precarity, the victims of precarity, are not able to construct a force that was uh, created uh, at Gdańsk, uh, where we had masses of people who were able to organize themselves. So the authoritarian country was no longer 
uh, capable of existing. So right now we're lacking this idea for political identity. How? By knowing today that there is a large mass of people who are exploited within labor, so there should be a indignity and anger and a struggle. How do we use this to reforge it into a political force? And we don't have any answer. We can uh, complain to the state and blame the politicians, but we're only as strong as the political substance that they represent, the, the party that they represent. If our parties have, let's say, 20,000 people uh, in a 40 million state, then uh, I'm sorry, but it's, uh, that's the problem. So the question uh, for the source of political power today, where is it? Is it women, let's say? The main element of, of system reproduction, cultural and social sphere, uh, we should look towards women, uh, at these attempt, at attempts by women. But we cannot solve this issue easily. These uh, nice propositions regarding what we should do are laughable, basically. We should use political uh, resources to work out something new. And the last comment regarding the terminology. Allow me to return to what I said in the beginning. We should look at this process not as a process of creating a technological system, which is a system which ac accumulates uh, knowledge by externalizing it as capital, which is in controlled by capitalists, but also externalizing our knowledge that, that we have in our minds and that we use to create social networks, for example, which uh, to a large degree uh, oppose the logics of the capital by creating innovation. Uh, open source software, uh, free culture movements, etc. These innovations uh, are many. And there are this sort of a dialectic opposition to what is externalized uh, through capital. And now automation, robotization are just aspects of this process. But the process itself is well described by Marx. And um, a, when it comes to principle, nothing will change. But interpreting it is basically scholastics, which serves the system but does not serve any solution to, to any problem. And my last comment, looking for ideas uh, for the future. I would like Franco Baradi, I would like to write a quote by him. Uh, so we should not concentrate on property itself because of the growing role of knowledge in services. A large part of ownership of over this uh, resource is hidden within us, uh, but the abolition of labor uh, as products is at stake. So this is a very interesting proposition, and also to complement this, by Japanese Ojin Karatani, uh, a Marxist Japanese Marxist proposes. Uh, to switch from thinking about means of production to means of uh, trade, it's exchange. It's much more important. Means of exchange are much more important. And the relations of power within this context may be viewed differently. Thank you. Only very few of the aspects. But I think uh, the issue around innovation, given workers' say, is something that's really important. That that is not a trade-off. And Mr. Benning already mentioned uh, some examples. And if I look at the German example, you might be right that in the startup uh, community, very few companies come to a scale that is comparable to Californian uh, companies. But I think the German strength has always been in other fields. And especially in the fields where the workers' representation is strongest in the export industries, also current ones like robotics, Internet of Things, in machine production, etc. I think um, there the companies with the strongest uh, workers' representatives um, are also most comp competitive. And uh, for me also the argument that there have been uh, corrupted works councils um, is not an argument against it. Because if you give power to people, um, there is a danger of them being corrupt. The same is true for politicians, uh, for any representatives. Um, if you would strip all these groups of power, then you would leave it just to the capital owners, 
because they have the power out of their capital and not given through an institution. So I think, um, for me, also to manage the change processes, Dominica talked a lot about uh, workers' representation is still valid, and I will come back to that at the very end of my um, contribution. What can politicians do and what are the limits? I would like to refer to the only female contribution to the discussion because I think that is a very crucial one if we talk about um, political power. Politicians very often, I would agree, um, have been too afraid to confront um, capitalists. But if we really see the danger of a power shift which is pushed by technological change, then now is the time that politicians really face also um, economic interests. And I would completely agree to what you said, that this can be easier done on a European level to join forces against um, economic interests that are for a long time no longer only on the national level, but on the supranational super -national level. Um, to refer to the first speaker, because I think this is an important aspect, the, the question of machine learning, what does it mean? Um, there again, I, I would agree that we need to put limits into the system. Um, and for example, in Germany there has been a commission on autonomous driving, self-driving cars, and how should this should be regulated. And um, the um, conclusion was that we should use machine learning to make the systems better, but the systems that are really working on a car that is on the street should not be learning because we don't know where it goes. So we, we, uh, the, the machine in the car is not learning, but we use the data that is produced there to make the machines more efficient, but have to have some control on that. And I think there are some limits um, which we really have to um, put on a UN level, try at least to get agreement there to some kinds of machine learnings. And that is especially automated weapons, weapons that decide themselves on the targets uh, they are killing, the so-called kill vehicles. I think that is a crucial issue actually on the international agenda to become active there. To go back to the world of work, and this is my concluding remark, if I look at all the changes that are happening, all the new types of work that are being established and appearing, if you talk to these people, and not only individuals, but also um, doing um, research there, you can see that a lot of things remain with all the things changing. People want a decent work, they want a decent pay, and they want a paycheck rather than having only a social uh, welfare contribution to them. They want a job that doesn't kill them or doesn't make them ill. They want a work that can reconcile private life and working life, and they want to have dignity when they are old and are no longer able to work. And I think this aims maintain, they are true for the well-paid industry worker as well as for the <coughs> not so well-paid um, worker in services as well as the platform worker who maybe is no longer a worker but is self-employed. So if these aims are there for such a diverse group of people who all have one thing in common that is earning their living from working, why shouldn't there be the possibility to founding a platform like Ferdinand Lassalle did 154 years ago, um, combining forces of people who share interests to become political force also in the future. I think this is the task of the political left we are facing in the changes ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. A very uh, important, uh, well-reviewed publication is Matsuka, Mariana Matsukato's uh, Enterprise State. And the introduction to this book, to the uh, Polish book, was uh, written by Mateusz Morawiecki, the current prime minister of uh, the Polish government. And the last sentence is as follows. It's, I will not quote, I'll paraphrase it. But the meaning behind it is that it is a great challenge for us. The, the process of digitalization and automation of labor is a great challenge for us. Full stop. And that's the end of the introduction. So the entire introduction to this book is dedicated to uh, bringing up in public debate the state as an active actor in economic life. What is very interesting, Mateusz Morawiecki 
clearly indicates in the introduction that the state should function, should provide services to, cap to the capital, that it should not, uh, he stresses that the state should not replace the private sector in economic processes. I believe that this is a very, uh, these are very important issues. And today's conference is an attempt to introduce uh, more thought, more pondering of regarding to with regard to automation and digitalization of labor into the public debate to add these sentences that are lacking from Moravisky's introduction, but also introducing a number of uh, issues uh, regarding the state as an active actor promoting other forms of ownership. Uh, than the private ones. The other goal that we had with this conference is to indicate that the process of automation and digitalization of labor is a political process, that there is no technological determinism. It's political decisions uh, that will influence the social results of these processes, and this is an issue related directly to the democracy and the democratic control over social processes and economic processes. I'm very glad uh, that we could have this uh, discussion with such uh, uh, such renowned guests, not only from Poland but also from abroad. And I would like to thank you once again for participating in our meeting. I would also like to thank our audience for showing up in large numbers, especially those who uh, have visited us from uh, different uh, cities. I wish you a safe return home. And I hope that our tradition of having debates uh, in an international crowd uh, related to LaSalle will be continued. This month, the uh, Democratic Party uh, of Germany will uh, have its Congress regarding its cabinet. Perhaps we will be able to invite a person who will become, who will take charge of the party. And I do believe that Torben Albert will convince the new leaders of SPD that it is worth coming here visiting uh, the grave of the founder of the SPD and to discuss with uh, the citizens of Wrocław and Poland uh, the challenges that await us in the future because the problems that we face, and this was very stressed in our discussion, are not national, they're global, so we should look for global solutions. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. All of the publications that are outside of this room are uh, free to take. So. Thank you.